you know, just to bring everyone up to speed, if you don't know, we are now two thirds of the way into our first cohort here. And we've been lucky enough to now have two of these panels. This is now our third uh, featuring our different startups working in our different uh, verticals from you know, the last two weeks in regenerative uh, aquaculture to you know, doing now coast resilience. But more importantly, again, it's all about these solutions that are coming together to build systems of solutions and not just pumping out one-off startups. And more than anything else, really about building the blue tech ecosystem and a regenerative one, both here in South Florida and far east. So our setup for today, we're going to do, uh, we're have each of our, our startups introduce themselves, give you, give you guys the rundown on their pitch. And then from there, we'll jump into some predetermined questions that take us probably, I would say 20 to 25 minutes, and we'll leave the last 15 to 20 minutes for questions for you guys. So feel free to pop your pop any questions that you have into the chat and you can, uh, we'll have a Q&A at the end and it'll be totally for you guys to get to connect with these amazing founders and uh, really learn more about what they're working on. So with that, uh, Anya, you're already off mute. So I'll throw it to you first to give the rundown on what you're doing at Addition Company. And you can share your screen if you'd like. Yeah, Sure. So nice to meet everybody. My name is Anya, and I'm one of the co-founders of the Addition Company. We're based in Miami, and essentially we are 3D printing living seawalls. So our project is a convergence of three technologies. One is 3D printing, two is materials, and three is sensor tech. So with 3D printing, we're using ro uh, robots. So we have a robotic arm that works on site. And we have a gantry that works locally uh, 24 hours a day to print panels. And what 3D printing allows us to do is to execute the walls cheaper, uh, faster, and create walls that last longer than conventional seawalls. And most excitingly, 3D printing gives us freedom of design. So the printer doesn't care if we print a wall that's flat and if we print a wall that has a special shape. So in this case, we are printing the walls in the shape of um, uh, mangrove roots and coral, re coral reefs. So it becomes a habitat for biodiversity, which therefore improves the quality of water. And we can still deliver it cheaper. So that's the first convergence. The second is materials. So usually seawalls are reinforced with rebar. And that's one of the reasons that seawalls only last about 30 years is because the rebar uh, underwater expands and it pops the concrete. So instead we're using minimum rebar just to satisfy building codes. And instead we're reinforcing the seawalls with recycled marine plastic fibers. So I'm sure you've all seen the images of these like, floating plastic islands. So a lot of companies collect the plastic but uh, everyone's looking for ways to utilize it. So we've been able to use it to grind it down to a fiber and actually uh, use it as an additive in our concrete uh, mix. Uh, which actually makes the walls twice as strong and allows them to last 50 years, 50 to 60 years instead of uh, 30 years traditionally. So that's the second convergence. And then finally, uh, sensors. So all of our uh, seawalls have sensors that track live water quality data. So there has been, as many of you know, if you're involved in blue tech, a big revolution in sensors in the last few years. So what we're doing now would have been totally cost prohibitive just two years ago. And what they have done recently is found a way to reduce the amount of sensors. Basically now it's like um, you can track, well, we are tracking 15 different data points with one sensors. In the past, you would have needed 15 sensors and each one is like $10,000. Now it's all in one, it's economic. And with 5G, we can get that data uh, onto our, 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 our laptops um, live and the seawalls actually communicate. So it's not just single points of data, we can track movement of things like algae or toxins or even water temperature um, uh, and, and, and currents. So, so, so that basically summarizes uh, the idea. It's the 3D printing, the sensors and the, and the materials. And the final product is uh, seawalls, uh, which there's a big market for and, and um, a big movement now to install seawalls all over the US. There's big plans for seawalls by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. In Miami, where we are, it's kind of like the center. It's a, it's a city to really face rising sea levels um, at scale. One of the first cities to face it at scale. So everyone here is really focused on innovation, which has been a wonderful place for us you know, to begin this journey. 
So nice to meet you all. I'm looking forward to your questions. Thanks, Anya. Gabrielle, let's uh, hear about Cpremo. Sure. Um, let me share my screen. Tell me when it's working. There you go. Looks good. Cool. Um, well, I, I'm Gabriel Savio. I have here with me Honore Gabriel, which is our CDO. I'm the CEO in Supremo. And well, Supremo does natural disasters forecast and monitoring. We empower intelligent decision making to take on climate change. We're a technology driven solution for proactively building resilience and reactively enabling management of natural disasters. So Supremo saves lives, improves critical decision-making for companies and governments alike. But first of all, I would like to tell you why I'm doing this. And uh, well, uh, I would like to start from this. In 2016, I was running another startup here in Brazil. And I was going to a meeting when suddenly a flood affected me. And well, I saw cars floating, people crying, people swimming in the street. And it was a really, really bad experience. And that made me thinking that me, a guy who doesn't live in a vulnerable area from Sao Paulo was being affected for these events, uh, made me thinking how people who live in areas like this deal with these problems on weekly, monthly, even daily basis. And uh, made me thinking that I have to do something to help them, to help to save their houses, to save their things, to save their lives. And in 2018, when I had the chance to work with Sao Paulo State Civil Defense, which is the most relevant player in the whole South America for the sector, I saw that uh, opportunity I was looking for to solve this problem, to deliver real solutions for that people to save their lives, to save their histories. And went in, uh, going deeper on the, the scenario, I saw that the, the losses were massive on the financial way. Uh, the potential of devastation is even more massive and the social hazard was the the turning point that made me, not only me, but the whole Supremo's team understand and see that the, the, the solution we, we were looking to develop was really needed because we lost more than 10,000 people every year due to these natural disasters and climate change events. And that made us understand that we have to do something and the, the solution is, really needed to save this, this, these people all around the world. And working inside the Sao Paulo State Civil Defense, as I said, we saw that the solutions to uh, feed our why and to deliver real solutions for the problem may pass through developed prevention actions to support decision-making, to create an assertive way for communication and integrating data. So then we created Supremo, which is um, platform that works totally on cloud and it's where our users can receive the predictions and do the monitoring of the area we're covering on. We developed this AI, which is capable of providing information on where, when, and what disaster may occur in the next hours. So we offer for users this opportunity to window a way to support their decisions, to improve their resilience, to act before the events happens, to mitigate or even totally avoid the negative impact caused by these events in their operations. Today, we are able to, to, to forecast all these top 10 events. This is the top 10 events of incidents, not only here in Brazil, but in the States and the whole world. And this shows us how impactful uh, are our technologies and how can we uh, touch peoples and touch businesses and companies and communities through our technologies by predicting this whole, uh, this whole top 10 events. And that's why, that's why our AI and the whole solutions works. Our AI monitors the area 24 hours a day. So 
no vacation, no holidays, no weekends. It monitors the area all the time. And when it predicts something imminent, hours before it happens, we notify our users. So then they can have, as I said, this opportunity window to act, to mitigate or even avoid the whole negative impact that this, that this event will cause in their operations. They can manage the responder team, they can relocate um, resources, uh, remove people from vulnerable area, and well, do so many things to improve resilience, to improve the preparedness and save the whole, um, the whole things that are affecting for these events in their operation, in their community, in their society at all. And since 2020, we saw that our value are being uh, useful for the whole community, for the whole society, but we could do even more. So then we created our vertical that we call contextualization. And it's where we um, take our analysis and from our perspective, we generate operational insights on each business we are covering. So basically I can create specific frameworks on each businesses I'm covering and offering, and, and offering for them uh, operational insights about what they have to do uh, based on the, the, the conditions, the whole AI are prediction. So as I'm predicting, for example, for an insurance company, a flu that will be uh, happening in some area, I can say that this flu will happen in that area, but it will affect a thousand of your clients and you have to relocate your responder team to that in the next hours because if that flu happens, you will have uh, great problems. So uh, kind of insights, operational insights that allows the businesses to be proactive, impactful and uh, resilient by doing their management, by uh, supporting a way to do, to they do the a climate, a climate friendly management of their businesses. And there's another thing that I would like to outline for you guys, that is, we're not doing a meteorological thing. We're not doing a meteorological forecast. So uh, I take it as one of a thousand variables to do our analysis. We integrate private sources, private data sources, public data sources, national, international partners, and even client sources to do this analysis and offer for users a real value to understand how the climate change will affect their business, affect their lives, affect their uh, society, and how to deal with this on a proactively way, on, uh, with, a, with, with, um, with resilience and with preparedness is to deal with these problems and uh, be ready for it. So with our solutions, we offer for our users predictability, support decision-making, uh, all of our uh, all of our solutions are aligned with uh, UN, IRIS Plus, and the CFD frameworks. So, our technology offers innovation, smart city concepts, smart city concepts, and surely fitting our why, we offer a way to support the culture of preparedness and resilience to save the people, to save the uh, the losses these events cause in all society. Um, a few months ago, we were listed as one of the best golf techs in the whole Ibero-America, according to uh, an, an, uh, uh, an Spanish university. And a few months ago, again, we was listed as one of the best analytics, uh, uh, one of the best predictive analytics companies from Brazil. And that was really cool because shows us that we are delivering real solutions, solving real problems, and we are on the right way to, uh, to feed our why, to help people, to improve resilience and preparedness, and to be ready to prepare, to, to deal with these whole problems caused by the climate change. So this is Supremo, we are technology predicting the future and ensuring our present. Thank you so much, Gabrielle, that was awesome. Well, uh, as we now transition, we're going to have a few questions for you. Uh, and really, again, to, to all of you guys out there, um, feel free to put your questions in the chat as we go along here. Uh, we're going to have some subjects, that, there's some questions of our own that are going to help probably spark some ideas with all of you. And I did want to also, um, you know, just say Cameron from Teak Labs, unfortunately, is unable to join us today. 
but we will be featuring him in a future panel for sure as you get to know him. Uh, so all that being said, uh, getting back to you, Anya, I'll start, start our questions with you. How do you see coast resilience evolving as a blue tech sector? Yes, I think it's the, well, first of all, it's a must. I think there is no, there are no coasts, there is no coastal resilience without blue tech going forward. I think, you know, individually we can make an impact on coastal resilience. The governments can make a little impact, but it's limited. Like impact at scale really has to be, I see it as being something that's achieved by blue tech companies and by uh, entrepreneurs and really people for outsiders. So people are really looking at these problems from a different lens. In this case, the lens of technology and, uh, um, and uh, kind of disrupting the status quo and changing our trajectory. So I think that it's a must that uh, startups are and blue tech companies are involved in finding a solution. Like for example, with the carbon removal, like Elon Musk recently announced this award, Elon Musk and Peter Diamandis, a hundred million dollar award for a startup that you know comes up with a solution how to remove carbon. And that the impact of that is gonna be enormous, right? It's something that can be scaled. So yes, we can do things individually, like take less flights or with my with seawalls or coastal resilience, we can go to mangroves and pick up some trash and that's wonderful. But it's really, really, really up to entrepreneurs to take the responsibility to find solutions and disrupt the trajectory that we're on now. And I love to say, and I've probably said this in at least one of these other panels uh, <laughs> where it's time for innovation to start driving policy instead of policy driving innovation, right? And it's, we've had long enough for addressing climate change and for um, you know, for us here in South Florida, especially to do something about the effects it's going to have on us in the very, very near term. And so now we're seeing, you know, solutions like yours, Anya, that are really making the case to say, we don't have to wait for, <laughs> for the governments to get their stuff together that we can take it into our own hands. So, right, uh, great, right. And we can't really, like, you look at the, if, if you look at the projections when it comes to rising sea levels, it's happening now, like in the next 10 years, you know, it's going to be a rise of three to six inches. Even that is $11 billion a year in uh, uh, insurance losses just in South Florida. 20 years from now, by 2040, that means daily floods because the rising sea levels will be 12 to 24 inches. So there is no time to wait for governments to adjust their policies and building codes. It has to be done today. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just say one or two words that uh, if people aren't familiar with, bureaucratic and efficient, but leave it at that. Uh, Gabrielle, going to throw it to you. Same question. Uh, how do you see coast resilience evolving as a blue tech sector? Uh, well, as Anna said, uh, I agree to, uh, with all that she said, but I would, uh, I would add it that I see resilience as the key for our future in the whole sector. So uh, is, is the, the key to, to to support development of other solutions of um, technical tech, tech solutions for uh, material solutions. And it's really important to be considered for all the, the tech sectors, but in blue tech even more, because we're literally sometimes inside the ocean, understanding and looking all the problems and how the variables are considering all our things are, are, are working in that. So considering resilience as the key, I think it's the, 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 first, the first point of all, all solutions has to take. So to solve the, the natural disasters problems, surely you have to have resilience. To solve the sea level problem, you have to have resilience considering your your value map to solve uh, the problems for any kind of industry related of or not with with climate change we'll have to consider it well everybody will face will feel the climate change problems the climate change challenges and this as i said it's the key resilience is the key and the base to to have the support to solve the problems, to have all the solutions developed here. Um, I, I just would like to, to add Crude, my CDO in this conversation, he, he's jo he joined us here. So uh, just to, to make it more, 
dynamic, you know. But, yeah, since we are both Gabriel, it's kind of yeah. Kinda call me Sarhu and call him Kruj. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> so, um, really quickly, let me just tell my two cents on that. Uh, as as my view stands, I believe that we are at the precipice of really utilizing big data and the internet of things, which are concepts that have been around for 10 or 10 plus years now. Uh, but we are at the precipice of really utilizing those concepts uh, at a hands-on level to better uh, equip ourselves and to better prepare ourselves uh, to better develop uh, solutions that will have real impact on <clears throat> coastal development and on natural disaster prediction development. Uh, I believe the time is now. We, as Anya said, we cannot wait anymore, any longer. And fortunately, we are seeing change in these areas. I also believe that we shouldn't need approval from bureaucratic institutions to make change. And hopefully we won't have to wait. Our results will speak for themselves first. Agreed. And, I, and I think that last piece, the results speaking for themselves, those are results that aren't just about impact, but also economic too, right? Because Surely. I mean, my limited experience so far with politicians is definitely that it's amazing how quickly when you put a dollar in front of something, they'll pay attention. So <laughs> it's a, it's really about creating, you know, we've, we've made the case for impact all, all, you know, over years and years at this point. But I think the real case that we can really create moving forward with innovation is also an excellent point. So all, all really good points. I'm going to throw it back to Anya for this next question, which is what are some some of the benefits of your technologies beyond just building coast resilience? Sure. So because our project is a convergence of a few areas of technologies, there are benefits, which I touched upon. So of course, the quality of water is improved the quality of uh, the biodiversity is improved. So by the way, when you, when you, when you install a flat seawall, University of Miami did a study which showed that almost 50% of biodiversity leaves within one year. So now when we're not just you know, displacing biodiversity, but we're actually creating a habitat for biodiversity. But that's, I guess that's related to coastal resilience. Beyond that, it's the data. Like the data component is huge for us. It's such an easy, like a joint venture for us uh, with a company that had that sensor company in a, out of uh, New York that uh, we're collaborating with for the sensors and we will maintain the ownership of that data. And that's something that's gonna create additional income for us and allow us to scale. So that's exciting. And then of course the materials, the benefit is using the marine plastic fibers uh, that I mentioned. So a few different uh, a few different areas that are a little bit beyond just having a resilient coastline. Yeah. And I think in general, just in case people aren't familiar with what coast resilience is, I mean, yes, it is kind of self-explanatory of you know creating a resilient coastline, but you know, that encompasses not only infrastructure like what addition company is working on, but you know, coral reefs, mangroves, right? These are all wetlands. They're all forms of creating coastal resilience. And so when we talk about creating more biodiversity, that is part of creating a resilient coast because if there's no biodiversity, then, you know, all these natural structures start to fail and ecosystems start to fail. So uh, great points, Anya. Gabrielle, Sa Savio, sorry. We'll, uh, we'll start with Savio and go to Crude after. I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna work on my Gabrielle's. Yeah, better this way. So, um... I would say proactively, surely, because, well, today all of the management in our sector is made under reactively way. Basically waiting the event happen, the problem come, the losses happen, and then they try to do something. So uh, I think what we can, if I would mention, I think um, the most important thing that our solution, our technology brings to the the whole community is this proactively way to act to deal with these problems. Um, for example, our technology allows us to people act on different levels before these events happen. So uh, as Danny said, the, the financial problem uh, is, is, is matter for, for it, the whole uh, 
social problems, the whole solution, the whole situation matters for everything. But there's a, 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 a mention here that I saw from FEMA that they said for every dollar you spend in mitigation or prevention, you save six in the future for uh, actions after the, the events happen. So it makes sense to act on proactively, not only for the only for the social way, for the human way, for the environmental way, the ocean way, but still on the financial way. Everybody, all the different perspectives shows us that we have to be proactive on dealing with this problem. So um, our technology uh, still, as I said, can, can be useful to, to help these 10,000 people that, that, that dies every year. And there's, a, there's another thing that we can't measure, you know, we're talking about lives. So uh, this shows us how important it is to act, how important it is to be proactive, how important it is to, to do something everybody can do, everybody can be resilient, everybody can be uh, prepared for these events, everybody can do something to improve your community, to improve your daily life, and in some way to help these people all around the world, not only here in the States, in, in Brazil, uh, as we are focusing here, but uh, we saw a few weeks ago floodings happening in Germany, places that it never had been. So uh, shows us that the problems are getting even more close to us. As my my experience in 2016, I I've never thought that that could help with me. That that could happen with me. Uh, as I said, I live in in an area here that has no 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 vulnerable thing so uh, i'm out of this 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 public but it still happened with me in 2016 uh, it's still happening in germany we saw new york a few weeks ago again at the subway the that the thing with the water and the whole the whole situation that it it's really mad and well again Proactively, preparedness, re resilience, this all point, all these points are the keys. And if I would say uh, uh, the most important point of our technology to, to help on this preparedness and resilience, I would say proactively. This is the key to help these opportunities, windows in different ways here in our occasion with the climate change events and natural disasters but in different ways to act to improve our society, resi uh, our resilience in our society and our preparedness in different levels in our communities. Awesome, crude. anything else like that? Yeah, uh, I would like to add just real quick that since the focal point of our, um, all our systems, our company is data, I believe there is a huge, um, there's very good synergy, which actually is the next question, but uh, there's very good synergy between our, the data we can provide and mitigation actions we can take so that uh, the impacts are lessened. It's basically that. Our main focus is to provide categorical and valuable data so that other companies may uh, act upon it and minimize all risks and minimize all impacts possible. I believe that's all. Oh, good. No, no, it took me a second to unmute. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, no, I think, I think those are all good points and I'm, and I'm glad you are, you're getting to the spoiler for the next question. So uh, at Seaworthy, we talk about building systems of solutions that work together synergistically to build regenerative blue economy. So my question is, how do you see your technology working in coordination with other solutions? Anya, I'm going to throw it back to you because I did already hear you touching on, you know, you guys developing some data uh, applications for your seawalls. And uh, we've already had some discussions about who you could be working with in the cohort. So we'd love to hear your thoughts. Yes, and, and I'll get to that. And first, I just want to say that our whole business model is really about convergence. 
a convergence of existing technologies. And that's what really allowed us to grow so quickly because we're not starting from scratch. Like even our robots, we took from our robots that build houses and we customize them, you know, and then we and then and then we got exclusivity to use them uh, globally. So that's really been a key to the, the our the speed of our growth. And within Blue Tech, of course, like the sensor has been incredible. Like if we were to develop our own sensors, right, it would take us years to get to the point where the sensors, uh, our sensor partner is today. And again, we we put in place an exclusivity agreement with them, so that so that gives us this. Um, Security and, the, and the, we, we, we get the benefits of, of both of us get the benefits of each other's uh, innovation in markets without having to put the R&D time and, and money into it ourselves. So the convergence is huge and something else we're looking into is also, of course, uh, 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 collaborating with companies that, um, that map uh, uh, the ocean, basically, so we, our data can be uh, inputted into their systems. That's exciting. And even something like there's a seaweed, a lot of seaweed companies in our cohort. So the idea of growing some of the seaweed on our seawalls, it's just the possibilities are endless. And we're very, very open to all of those conversations because that's really the, the, found, the foundation of our whole business is this idea of convergence. And I will just say we are also very much leaning into the word convergent. Uh, recently, uh, actually in the blog post I have coming out tomorrow, we're going to talk about that being core evolution of our, our focus uh, at Seaworthy. But uh, Gabrielle, would love to hear some of the work that you've got going on uh, in the convergence arena. Yeah, um, Not, okay. excuse me, I would like to go take ahead. the lead on that. <laughs> Gabriel works for both, so go ahead. <laughs> I, know, I'm, I'm, yeah. I think that's all. I'll get it down. It's all good. Um, so as we mentioned before, our company focuses on data and that's great for us and for everyone that works with us because uh, data is, in our opinion, the basis of every good decision. We must have um, good quality data to make decisions to support decision-making, to support uh, the construction of um, solutions and be they, be they tangible or intangible. So our main goal right now is to work with other companies as much as we can to provide data that they can use um, to work with their own products, to be this kind of catalyst, this kind of focal point uh, and hub for them to improve upon. So we mainly have been providing data to other companies so that they can build their own products faster and with more, um, let's say, creative liberty, because they don't have to wait around gathering data, gathering data that they, that they can trust uh, and just focus on the planning processes of their own um, projects, their own developments. And I think, as Anya said, as we've been saying, convergence is the main point for all this. Convergence is important because without it, we would be uh, lesser than the sum of our parts. And the point here is to be bigger, uh, is to always achieve more by working together. Yeah, that, there's another thing that I would like to to add to 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 your point, Crude, is that. Um, the, this vertical that we started to develop uh, at the end of the last year uh, that, that I sh uh, showed you, we call it contextualization, and it's where we take our analysis and from our perspective, create these frameworks on which businesses we're covering and support their decisions from the climate change perspective, generating operational insights. And this kind of technology that we are working here, that we are um, developing here, it's another, another thing that we can take in advance to, to solve this, uh, this the, the whole problem, to converge in it all, to create all the solutions uh, and create new solutions uh, as well. As we are doing here, we are applying our technology in so many different sectors. Uh, I, I said, uh, uh, I, I think I said that we are applying here in insurance, in hydroelectrics, in logistics, in silviculture, and all of these sectors are being impacted for the climate change in different ways. 
and the technology that we are developing here, we are working here, um, it allows us to, to touch it, to deliver solutions, to deal with climate change in different sectors. And this is another key point that I would like to, to add to, to your point, Kud, that is the, the technology, it's really important. And uh, the way we are doing here allows us to do this, new frameworks to deliver uh, uh, the same values of preparedness, of resilience on different sectors from different perspectives, from different perspectives. Um, there's another thing that I just remembered about, uh, you know, conversion and uh, synergies between the, the whole seaworthy companies uh, in this first cohort is that, again, talking about the, the technology, taking it as a, a key point, we can apply it in different ways. And we, uh, a few weeks ago, we started to, to talk and, and to discuss a few projects with our companies here in Seaworthy and see, uh, started to see the synergies between companies that was not obvious in the first, the first saw. So, uh, this was really cool because, again, shows us that the technology is the key and the, the turning point to deliver solutions, but the whole data, the whole uh, solutions around and focusing on the same problems can be convergent to, uh, to deliver a real and a real solution and an powerful solution, an impactful solution that can make the difference on any on any sector. As I said, we're doing here in different sectors and talking with the, the other startups in, in the cohort, we saw other opportunities in sectors that we are not exactly looking for, but converging it all, uh, focusing and working each, each one on your on your expertise, we can deliver and improve the whole uh, values about preparedness, resilience, and the, the whole pack to deal with climate change problems and uh, natural disasters events. Well, Gabriel, I think one of the great points you touched on, Savio, uh, is, uh, is that you know, the, it, it really is cross-sector, and I like to even say cross-disciplinary. Right, and that the approach that is happening, the evolution of what's happening when we talk about building convergence is bringing in together stakeholders who may have traditionally never worked together. You know, bringing together technologies that people never thought would ever work together. Right, from Anya, what you guys are doing with seawalls, where it's more than just a concrete slab, to you know, actually creating uh, you know opportunities to leverage emerging technologies. Um, and I know you know we've talked about Titalik and. You know, what they're doing as far as building a digital twin working with you guys so a lot of different opportunities there um i'm gonna go to our last question and then if we if we don't have many questions in the q a we can have one backup but again this is our last question before we jump to q a and anya i'll throw it back to you and that is what advice do you have for current and aspiring blue and climate tech entrepreneurs looking to fight climate change and rising sea levels with innovation so one is going back to convergence to really lean on existing ideas, existing resources and assets. You don't have to build it all yourself and really outsourcing as much as possible, like even outsourcing things like um, marketing or social media or things like that. You don't need an in-house team. It's really amazing. There's no better time to be an entrepreneur as now. We have access to incredible labor at an amazing, amazing uh, low cost. So that's one. And two is to not forget economics. And I think for us, we have economics as first and then the environmental impact, it has to be second because unless we can sell this product, you know, we can't force people to install these seawalls just because it's better for the environment, especially when it comes to government projects, they're really bound by economics. So we really try to find a solution, you know, that achieve that we could build faster and cheaper and less labor. And that opens so many doors for us to then have the impact, that, the environmental impact that we have. Uh, Savio, same question for you. Finally getting the Gabrielle sorted. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I totally agree with Anya. And uh, I would add, uh, well, the key word of this whole panel. I would say for new entrepreneurs that you have to have resilience, not only on dealing with climate change, but in all fields of your life. Because, mm -hmm. well, you have days that you're a superhero, you're doing a panel in the, in the whole uh, Seaworthy team, doing this amazing thing here, but there's some days that you're maybe, uh, I don't know, doing things that you're being upset to do, but you have to do. So be resilient, not only on the climate change way, but for your whole life. It's the key to be uh, 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 the uh, the best entrepreneur you could be in, in the whole sectors you would like to 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 act on. So I would say that the key the, of this this panel could uh, could fit all the, the the different fields of our lives and in different ways. But it's really important to be resilient because, as Anya said, some days you will have to think more about the money some days you have to think more about the product and some days you have uh, bad days and you know be resilient for your life <laughs> thanks gabriel crude same question for you well um i'll try to pick on a point i'll try to pick up a point that hasn't been talked about so as the major uh as an executive per se Leading, uh, dealing with data and my company, I would say that trust, really look and trust your data. I believe it is not only the data you produce, but the data you're collecting. Uh, as Anya said, there are many great sources to build up on and you don't have to reinvent the wheel every time you want to do something. So really look into what you're collecting, really look into what you're trying to build data-wise. And as a last point, don't be shy or afraid of trying new things just because they're concepts uh, as long, so long as, it, as, it, as they have any type of scientific or scholar uh, backing behind them. You can try anything as long as it, it is uh, minimally acceptable. <laughs> I love, um, you know, the, the, the design thinking approach on this that you're touching on is, is really, you know, just not being afraid to fail and in fact, embracing it. And that is actually getting back to other Gabrielle's point by definition, very much resilience. Right. And so I think it, it's amazing how it all, all ties in together to not only be about what we do for the environment, but what we do for ourselves, because people forget a lot of entrepreneurship is the human side of it. Um, and so I think it's a really great point all around, guys. Um, I haven't seen many questions pop in the chat. So I'm going to be, I have one more question for you guys that I've prepared. But again, really encouraging all of you who are still, who are still here, feel free to put questions in the chat. These guys are here for you. Um, it's for you guys to get to meet and know these founders. Obviously, by now you've heard they're doing some amazing work. So don't be shy. Uh, normally, uh, we, we get some good back and forth between those attending here and, and our founders. So happy for you guys to jump in. But with that being said, I have another question prepared for you guys. So that is, how do you see your solution and systems of solutions scaling to drive broader ocean and climate impact? Big picture thinking here. Uh, Anya, I'm going to throw it back to you. I'm so glad you came back with this question because this is my favorite question because it's really like a fundamental value of our company and the whole idea behind this project because there are 500 cities worldwide at risk from rising sea levels. And the infrastructure and construction that we use now to address rising sea levels is completely cost prohibitive in most of them. So in fact, there are many of these cities are planning to just move inland instead of trying to save them. So, so we have to really prove the concept as quickly as possible and then create a business model that's scalable. So we're not looking for a local solution. We're looking, in the words of Peter Diamandis, for a moonshot. So a moonshot is something that impacts a billion people. It's something we can do within 10 years. And, uh, and it's something that you know people said couldn't be done, but we, we proved that it can. So we are thinking moonshot. 
And how do we do that? Is the business model is the platform. So we quickly prove the concept in Miami, we prove the economics, and then we create a platform which, uh, which empowers local contractors and construction teams to execute these projects. So we provide the equipment, the robots, and we finance it so it's affordable. We provide the materials uh, and we provide most importantly, the training and the whole community uh, uh, around it and access to things like green bonds, you know, which, which we will be using uh, in our global project. So, so yeah, scale is really, really important to us. And it's something we have to, we can't go to 500 cities and build these seawalls ourselves. We have to create a platform to empower local communities to be able to implement uh, this te technology and really scale. Savio? Wow, this is... The, this was one of the most important questions we, we got in our mind when we were building our solutions here because, well, we are talking about climate change events, natural disasters, and again, like about the data we needed to do and all the stuff, but we should, we should be scalable to, to be a startup, you know. So this was one of the first questions we had here and all of our development was based to be scalable first. And this um, uh, besides our, our business model allows us to be, I think the most scalable we could be today because uh, I love to say that we do all this forecast and monitoring without any, any kind of hardware. We are totally hardware free, and this is uh, this is only possible due to our partnership. So, our business model allows us to do these kind of things. We take this data from private sources, from public sources, from partners that cover the area, and even clients. As I said, we can take their their data to do this analysis, and we still surely we still have. A few robots here that we developed to collect data from satellite and drawn drawn images as well. But this was one of the most uh, things that we considered here to be scalable because, well, just like the United States, Brazil is uh, it's a huge country and the problems are all around in, in the the places and. Uh, we saw opportunities in different states here, and as we've seen in different countries at the same problem. So, being scalable was the first, uh, the first one of the first questions we had, and we solved it by combining our technology and our uh, our business model to 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 make it possible. Well, Krug, go ahead, talk about even more uh, about the, the technology thing. I think, well, sure. you're the CDO uh, guy, I think they will be interesting to understand it. Yeah, in fact, uh, we are very proud of that. I am personally very proud of that because our solution was born to be scaled. And uh, we have never done it, but theoretically, it could be scaled in a continental level, not only... We have done it for the national territory, but in theory, we could do it for the whole world. Uh, yeah, United States, it's still in America. Brazil is in America, so same continent, you know? Yes. <laughs> we have no but... project in Africa yet, in Nigeria <laughs> yet, but we can scale for other countries and we are doing it again. So we see a lot of potential in that and we hope to still keep developing and still maintain our scalability as it is because it is it's very close to ideal and it helps a lot for sure well i'm going to throw one more for fun question in because i'm seeing uh not, not seeing many questions come in the chat so i have one more for fun one curveball and anya i'll throw it back to you uh what is the best thing that you've learned or had happen as part of the cohort so far <laughs> Well, I'm just really impressed with the speed that you're you're operate under. Just incredible! Like I can't believe this is the first cohort. 
And I saw your calendar. You have like 17 meetings a day. You're just killing it. So I've been really inspired by you personally and by your team. And it has really made me accountable for also the speed, you know, that we're working on. Uh, and and uh, yeah, so that, that's been my, my, my biggest takeaway. Oh, thank you, Anya. Savio? Yeah, I totally agree with Anya, but I would say that uh, this this network we're building here, the possibilities, the opportunities we can generate between uh, the, the whole companies in here. And well, uh, I would say that this uh, network opportunity to connect with different companies, with uh, potential clients, with potential data sources, this has been, um, one of the most valuable things for us. And as uh, well, we're based in Brazil, we're um, starting our operations in the States. So all of these things are new for us and being a newbie guy in the States without knowing anybody could be uh, worse than have been. So uh, the, being part of this cohort is making us to understand how do you guys do business in there? Because it's similar, but it's not the same. It's not equal uh, as we do here in Brazil. Uh, understand how do you uh, uh, how do you pitch? How do you do presentations? How do you uh, connecting with governments, with uh, companies, and all this stuff? So learning all these things and uh, majorly being part of this uh, this network is being one of the most relevant things that I'm being learning with being part of this first cohort. Who do you have anything you want to add? Um, well, you could say I am a newbie here. Uh, I, uh, it's the first time I've been talking to all of you, uh, although I have been uh, informed by Savio of uh, previous uh, iterations of this cohort. Uh, I believe what I can feel for um, as someone who is more of an outsider than an insider as of now is that we th there's a lot of energy here there's a, a, a distinct and strong will to make change and i believe it is very hard to come by uh i believe i am very impressed by the structure by the scale by the conversation the topics those are all very uh, impactful and important. So I'm very happy to be a part of it. And I hope to meet you more, you all. Thanks, Crude. Well, MB has a question. Uh, would you like to unmute and ask it? Hello. So for Anya, you have been talking about how you have used uh, all this convergence to create your company. So I, I, I would like to know what's your idea because I, I, from what I understand, you have used all these different ecosystems, you could call them, to create your company and your ideas. So how, how could we bring these ecosystems into the cohort or the cohort into the ecosystems? What do you think? Okay, well, I saw you typed the question. Like you were asking about Peter Diamandis or Tony yes. Robbins. Yes. Yeah, I think that this cohort is so uh, impactful locally, and Daniel has amazing contacts locally, and that's the reason he's had this incredible speed. But I think what you're talking about is more like national, like global ecosystems, right? Like Tony Robbins ecosystem, the Peter Diamandis ecosystem. And I think it's a yeah. wonderful idea. Like Peter Diamandis, I keep talking about him. I'm like, a, a, a fan girl, but he's like a very famous futurist, and he has this event every year called Abundance 360, where he brings people from every area of technology. Like one day is about 3D printing, one day is about like AI or, or robotics or whatever, and they all present what's coming in the next few years and discuss how can they work together. So for someone like Daniel to present at an event like that will be so impactful because I then you know both local to national explosion global and they have these very big resources all right financial resources so I think it's really exciting and although this is a new cohort I think already we're in a position 
where that's, a, I think, a, a very much a possibility. So if you can help us with that, MB, yeah. that would be great. <laughs> Yeah, I think uh, one one thing that came to mind is uh, the director of Singularity University. He uh, he became the director of Singularity University because he was invited to a conference as the biggest expert in robotics in the world. And he came to the conference, and after being in the conference, he said, "Oh, I don't know anything," <laughs> because he he listened to the other people. And usually when you have experts focused on one thing, you, 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 uh, you think that your thing that you're studying is the best thing. So, so I think that that's a, that's the, that's a valu very valuable thing that I'm seeing here because you're listening to what's going on somewhere else. So this guy, after being recognized as the biggest expert in robotics, he resigned to his job and said, I'm going to singularity because this is where I'm going to be listening to the best thing. So, yeah. So I, I love what you guys are doing. Yeah. Well, thank you, MB. And on that note, I'm going to, I'm going to wrap us up and give a quick rundown real quick of just some of the opportunities on Seaworthy site, if you guys aren't familiar. Um, but before we, before I do that, I want to thank Gabrielle, both Gabrielle's and Anya for all they've done today. Yeah. This is an awesome panel. And I always love uh, seeing some of the synergies flow and also just your enthusiasm. So thank you guys. Um, if you want to learn more about these startups and all the rest of the members of our cohort, you can go to the startups tab on our website. And there you'll see all of them listed, including our co-created startups, as well as these guys who are both crowdsourced existing startups. If you'd like to apply to be part of our next cohort, you can go to the O4SC or Opportunities for Sea Change tab on our website and go ahead and click apply and it will take you there. And then beyond that, if you aren't following us on social media, all the links are up here on the right side of the website as well. And actually little spoiler, tomorrow there's gonna be a big blog post coming out on the news tab of our website. And last and most importantly, not least, uh, we have one more panel left uh, of this series before we wrap up with our September Startups for Sea Change series. Next week we'll be featuring the Lasso as well as our other co-created startup, Clean Coast Innovations. So can't miss. Uh, please, uh, please make sure you've RSVP'd and you'll get the link to the Zoom. But all that being said, uh, really appreciate everyone's participation today. Um, and thank you guys so much. We'll see you next week. See you guys. Thank you. Guys. Thank you. Take care. Namaste. Thank you so much. <laughs> <Take> <laughs> Namaste. <care. laughs> see y'all.